Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. I'm a speedrunner. I just don't speedrun one game. I'm speedrunning the entire video game industry, so when I'm done, I'll have the world record for the first person to play every single video game. Let's see where we left off in 1981. We're now playing all the releases at some point in 1981, and we last played Avenger for the Commodore VIC-20. So let's press forward and see what our next release is. Ah... Excellent. We're now going across the pond to check out the latest release for your Acorn Atom. Oh, and there he is. Chris Curdy, co-founder of Acorn Atom. Let's take a look at Backgammon. If you thought the last time we're going to play Backgammon was a few years ago, no! Backgammon is going to go over and over. There's so many Backgammon games. So this is the Acorn Atom version, and we haven't had a lot of luck with Acorn Atom games loading. Either the cassette was corrupted, sadly, but who knows what will happen now. Let's take a look at the box for Backgammon by Bugbite. And any other artwork we have for that? Yes, we also have another one, and these came in cassette tapes uh, cases. So there it is, the Acorn Soft Backgammon. Very interested to see if this one loads. Uh, like we do with most backgammon games, it's not going to be a lot of gameplay because it's the same game you'd expect to play on a board. But let's see what happens when we load it up. I am uh, crossing all fingers and toes. Here we go, released at some point in 1981. This is Backgammon for the Acorn Atom. And then right off the bat, because the emulator is a little funky, we're going to switch up the view there, and we have to actually load the tape, find the tape, and put the tape in first. So we find Backgammon, and we open up the tape. Yes, it is the clunky, but that's how it works over here on the Acorn Atom. Okay, so then we find out what is on the tape catalog, and it looks like we just need to do load. Please load. Does it work? Oh, yes. We got the first one down. Go, go, go. It works. Do we want slow or fast? We want fast backgammon. Just like fast gammon we played on Apple II. There it is. Yes, we got an Acorn Atom game to load. It's been so long. So it has uh, our move, and you can see they're using mostly ASCII characters. Well, ASCII was, really wasn't the standard for the Acorn Atom, but they're using character sets to dis display the graphics. And uh, as usual, it's black and green. The resolution is way better than it would have been at the time. But it, it, essentially, it's the same game as Backgammon. You have to know which commands to push on your keyboard. It's giving us some indication in the middle. But it's a very rudimentary way to play. But... For Europe, if on the Acorn Atom, if you want to play a digital version of Backgammon, this is the one for you. And we are just going to showcase the, the what it looks like and the user interface. But for the time, uh, considering it's a board game, uh, this one, considering also the other Backgammon games we played, it's really not that good. If we play all the computer games so far on the channel, I'm going to go for a two-star rating for Backgammon. It's right at the top end of bad. Uh, especially for all the other games you could play instead for the home computer. However, for Europe, this would be a lot higher, but we're doing this on a global scale. So two stars for a backgammon for the Acorn Atom. And with that, let's see where we're going next. After the Acorn Atom, we're back in the States with the Atari home computer, and this is Bagels. Bagels. Looks like this is based on the, uh, the number game like uh, Mastermind. Uh, Pico Fermi Bagels, which I've never played, but uh, let's see what happens if we pop this in and play Bagels. Maybe we'll, we'll eat some bagels. For the Atari Home Computer, released at some point in 1981. So the way this works is you're supposed to guess someone's number, and we played quite a few games on the channel from this, uh, this formula. Who has the presumption to try to guess my secret number? Uh, me. Chrono. Would you like the rules, Chrono, yes or no? Yes, I would. Bagels is the number guessing game. Tell me how many digits you want to guess, and I will select a random number for you. Then try to guess my number. And so if you played Mastermind or I think Roto, it has lots of different names. But you're basically guessing the number. In response, I'm going to type Pico, Fermi, or Bagels. Pico means every digit you have is in the wrong place. Fermi means each digit you have is in the correct place. Bagels means no digit is correct uh, that you guess is in the correct place. If you've exhausted your allotted number of guesses... Or if you type a Q as a guess, you'll have to uh, you'll type the secret number and you'll play another you have a chance another chance to play. You may choose any number of digits from three to nine inclusive. Three to nine. So how many digits would you like to use? Let's do three. Make it easy. 
you'll have 390 chances to guess my secret number. 390? We're not going to be here that long. So we have one digit in the wrong place, one digit in the right place, or no digits match the target number. So my first guess is if I could do one, two, three. And then what it says is bagels. So we have no digits that match the target number. So we guess a totally different one. So I could do two, four, five. And that's still bagels. So this is all the game is. You are just trying to guess what the computer the number is, and then they give you kind of hints on how, the, uh, how to get the answer. It's almost like a, I, I would consider this game and Mastermind a lamer version of 20 questions. 20 questions is, is, is okay, but this one is just guessing the number. So if you're into that, check out Bagels for the Atari Home Computer. Otherwise, we're going to move on after Bagels and play our next game. So where are we going after Bagels? What will we play next? All right, so putting in the palm of our hand, the very first time we've seen a Game & Watch ripoff. This is, uh, I believe, by uh, VTech. Uh, yeah, so this is called Time & Fun instead of Game & Watch. And this is their game, Banana. So a different series of handhelds, uh, kind of a bootleg version. But there's an example of the box, very crude uh, picture we have. But it's called Banana, and it's yeah by VTech. And this is for the Time & Fun, which is... it's essentially the knockoff Nintendo Game & Watch. If you can see the format, it looks really similar too. If we look at the more of the artwork, this is the front and back of the box. And then there's another example. So this is released in um, uh, other parts of Europe. And this is the whole system itself. Notice the very similarities. The four buttons on the end, just like Nintendo Game & Watch, the Game A, Game B, and it does time as well. But this is time and fun instead of Game & Watch. Yeah, I know. We're doing a lot of food this this time on the episode. Bagels to bananas. All right, so we don't have any manual like usual. Handhelds don't have one included with them. But let's put it in the palm of our hand and see what's up with banana. Released at some point in 1981, most likely in Europe. And there we go. We're in. So right off the bat, we have four different buttons. Let's try them out. So there's my right side, two buttons. Left side, two buttons. Got it. And then for... Putting in, yeah, you can see how this works. I can use my little finger push game B, and I push game B, and then we're in. Oh, no. Game B. There we go. So they call it bananas because, oh, I see. So there's people that are walking around, same LCD graphics, very similar and sounding similar as the game to watch. But there's people moving around, and I have four different buttons, and I have to move and brush away the bananas on the end. Well, now I want to see what happens when they hit the banana. <laughs> yep, they slip out from underneath them. And then it shows me, I guess, uh, ambulances in the top right corner <laughs> of them going to the hospital after they slipped on the bananas. So I'm just supposed to be saving uh, the people by, you can see, moving from place to place. The same formula we've seen with um, Mickey Mouse and Wolf and a lot, a lot of the, the Game & Watch games. All right, so let's try again game A. I think it's an easier version of it. Yeah, starts off simpler, slower. But an excellent way to waste, uh, waste time and play something on the go in the palm of your hand. This is the typical standard for um, uh, pick up and play handhelds. We do have another system, the Milton Bradley Microvision, that is doing interchangeable cartridges. <laughs> so yeah, it's just it feels just like I'm playing a Nintendo game and watch. So the ripoff, the, the the ripoff feature is definitely there. I can't really tell what character I'm supposed to be, but if I gotta say anything, the Nintendo Game and Watch was using solid LCD characters. This is kind of cool seeing um, the an outline of the characters. So uh, graphics has a different choice. It makes it feel like I'm not really playing Nintendo Game and Watch. It feels a little different. We have seen the, the you know like a uh, Popeye. Uh, the first Popeye game or a licensed game or Mickey Mouse. The, the characters look really, really sharp. And this is pretty much it. So this is Banana, the latest handheld that you could put in the palm of your hand. That's not Nintendo Game Watch, our very first one. <laughs> All right, so for Banana, 
uh, it actually plays pretty good considering uh, it's a ripoff. Uh, I, you really can't do a lot with pl play control at this point anyway. But as far as uh, handhelds, it's still average. I don't want to really push it any higher for uh, above average. I'm still going to say it, it is perfectly average for 1981. So we'll do three stars. Well done for the, our first ripoff of the Nintendo Game & Watch. All right, and with that, let's see what our next release is after Banana. Is there any more food that's going to come up? No, no more food. All right, so we're going back to the VIC-20, Commodore VIC-20, and this is Bank Robber. Another one that's a little hard to come by. We don't have a box, at least one that I could find. This one is a cartridge, which we love to play for home computers. Let's pop it in the VIC and play. Released at some point in 1981, Bank Robber. What's up with Bank Robber? Really loving the releases we've seen for VIC-20 so far. It is brand new. It is the, the new computer on the market. All right, so I'm going to try Space Bar. Okay, Space Bar works. There we go. Bank Robber. They got the, give us the high score. $10 for each deposit. Bonus for clearing the vault and guards. And we see moving. P is up left, right, and down. So if you have a keyboard in front of you, whether you do or not, look down and look at what it would be like on a modern keyboard. The VIC-20 is laid out just slightly different where the slash is. Oh, yeah, this is really creepy to... You know, for me to control, we've had to do different combinations because modern times we're used to WSAD or um, uh, YG, uh, uh, YGHJ. So it's it's very interesting seeing like on the Apple II, you use I, J, K, and M. And this one's using a P, L, semicolon, and slash. Okay, so we're going to push F1 to start. I'm going to use joystick, but here we go. We're playing at Bank Robber. So we're in the game now. We didn't get an instruction manual or... Uh, they just said to go get the money. So I'm going to go get a money, some money, but I got someone chasing me. I don't know if there's a way to get rid of them. Let me try some buttons on the joystick and see if it works. Cool sound effects, though. Am I able to keep going? There we go. Okay, so moving on again. Do I have any buttons? I don't. It's just literally just, you're just running away from them. So if someone's chasing you, is it random? It looks like it's random. So I picked up some money. I'm going to head back to the bank. <laughs> the sound effects make me feel, oh, nice. So you cash in, then you move away, but it is, there's no power-ups. It is me just moving away or uh, avoiding the enemies. Yeah, there's no artificial intelligence, it looks like. They kind of do their own thing. But you stockpile the money from the bank, and then you try to get back to the, uh, the end to cash in. So I'm having to run again. Without the power-ups, it feels like a maze game that's missing something. But I guess if there's no really AI and they're not going to follow me around, then I just have to outsmart them. Ducking down hallways. <laughs> the pitter-patter sound is, is pretty quaint. That's pretty cool for bank robber. Oh, that's true. I haven't tried picking up more money. Let's see if I try more than one if I move slower. So if I get one... No, it looks like I only pick up one at a time. So uh, we played a game called Lupin 3 or Lupin the Third in the arcade. And that one allowed you to pick up more money to carry back. Uh-oh. <laughs> got me. And every time you picked up more money, you got heavier. This one, this mechanic is not in this game. So again, no. You reset. Okay, no. So you just go again. It, 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 it does stockpile your money. <laughs> it feels like I'm playing as an insect. And they can move slightly faster than me, so you have to be able to use the twists and turns. And it looks like this is the only maze we have, unless we collect all the money possibly let's see i want to resets from the beginning brutal it's got that vic 20 hard difficulty we've only played a few vic 20 games there, there's nothing known now as a vic 20 difficulty or vic 20 hard can i do it no nope, he's coming yeah so you have to plan ahead look at the maze and since you don't have any power-ups you're just trying to outsmart them the best you can so nothing cashed in there. Very simple premise. It looks like it might have been uh, just a homebrew game that was uh, that was created. We even we didn't even get the developer whenever we booted it up. Usually we can they t they tell us who the developer is. So there you go, cashing in, running away. What are the characters? Will he go in the vault? No, he won't. Okay, nice. So I'm gonna follow him and see if I can get. It. There we go. All right, does he go all the way? No, he doesn't go there. Okay, nice. So it looks like, am I safe on this side? <laughs> Works there, good. 
So my guess, I'm hoping that after you get all the money and you've cashed it in, it gives you a new maze. But there's no way to really know. And for, for the purposes of, of, of us showcasing the, the, the channel, we're not going to play and pick up all the gold and see if it does give you another maze or not. But um, the premise is uh, fairly simple. Top-down maze game. Very average for the time. Doesn't incorporate anything new uh, that we've seen. So I'm going to go ahead and do uh, two and a half stars. Uh, do I want to even go three, though? Is it really... Nah, we'll do two and a half. It's it's around average, slightly uh, slightly lower average, just slightly, but still around the average range. So two and a half stars for Bank Robber for the VIC-20. All right, let's see what our next game is after Bank Robber. What's happening next? Oh, yes. We are now going to see what's up with Japan. If you ask yourself, well, what's happening in Japan? What are they doing right now? This is uh, the second game I think we've seen on the show for the Epoch TV Cassette Vision. The very first, or one of the very first consoles they had in Japan. And I was lucky to find an advertisement for it. And uh, what I'd like to do is show you kind of what you'd see in Japan at the time. Because this is one of those systems that we cannot play. I can't find, I can find very little information for this. Because it had a sequel, the cassette Supervision. Uh, the Epoch Super Cassette Vision. And so uh, everywhere I look, I usually find more on that than the original. But the original is, uh, is 81, whenever it came out. All right, so let's see what happens if we check out what's going on in Japan. Nice, and we got some examples of the gameplay too, because the, the the I'm not able to emulate or play anything on the cassette vision, so that's really cool to see some of the the the, the gameplay of what it looks like because it's very similar to Atari, the Atari VCS, but this is what they were playing in Japan at the time, and just keep in mind it's still in its infancy. Japan really hasn't picked up on the whole the whole craze yet. And the big thing that Cassette Vision brings to the table for the video game industry is in Japan, they use the term cassette for games uh, like, like we did in North America for cartridges. So whenever you uh, have a new game in, out in Japan, they still refer to it as a cassette now because this is the first system that coined that term. If you're going to play a video game, it's on a cassette. That's, that's just the way it works in Japan. So sadly, this is all we have for artwork. There is no box. The only artwork I can find is a very crude front of the box and a very crude picture of baseball. So we're not able to play baseball and check it out. So no star rating for the cassette vision. If I could, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it a, a two star. No, you know what? I'm going to do an average rating. So I'll give it about two and a half. And if someone can give me a chance to play the cassette vision or a way we can play it, it's even hard to find video footage of other people playing on this system. That's how rare it is. But if you can give me a way to play it, we'll re-rate it. But in the meantime, we'll just say two and a half stars for baseball for the cassette vision. All right, with that, with that let's see where we're going next after baseball. All right, so this is another system. Very rare. This is the Intex Selecta game. This was the only other console right now, or uh, not a console, only other handheld right now, you could have interchangeable cartridges. The other one was the Milton Bradley Microvision, and this is Intex's Selecta game. You can actually take the cartridge out, put the cartridge in. Another one that's so rare. It existed. That's all I need. To, that's all you need to know about it, because there's no advertisement for it. I could find barely any artwork for it. There's the example of the system in the bottom left corner. It is massive. It's meant to be played with like multiple people at a time. You can see it uses. Um, uh, it's not using LCD. It's using the V. Uh, the, the the cathode ray tubes. So the the, the 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 graphics are very similar to the first handhelds we've ever seen on the channel back in the 70s, and the artwork that I have for this is just this image of Baseball 4. There's where the cartridges uh, slid in the bottom. One-on-one -on -one for two players. And then if you look on the far left side, the cartridge was at the bottom that you would pop out and put and put in. This is something that is, uh, I found some footage of gameplay on it, but a way for us to play it? No, there is nothing on this one. So for Baseball 4, same thing. Uh, I'm gonna do this one even lower uh, because uh, considering what the graphics are and other handhelds, Milton Bradley Microvision still has them beat. So this is still bad. I'm gonna do a one star and if anyone can get a chance for us to play it, we will re-rate 
and see, and see how well it compares to the other ones. All right, so that was Baseball 4 for Select a Game. Oh, and our next one is ba uh, Basketball 3. I don't know what happened to Basketball 2 and 1 and what happened to Baseball 1, 2, and 3. They may have been individual uh, handhelds for by Intex, and this was the way you could have interchangeable cartridges and play basketball. And this one's even harder to come by than that. So again, the only artwork I have for this is this picture of the, the cartridge, what you put over the top overlay of the, mm -hmm. the, the select division, and the uh, an example of the box. And that's it. So same thing for this one. We're doing one star. If you don't want to get away with that we can play this, then we'll re-rate, we'll play and re-rate. So there you go. That is the newest handheld in town that has interchangeable cartridges. I don't think it's going to stack up to the Milton Bradley Microvision because this is lost. Uh, this is very hard to uh, find information on and uh, get gameplay on. There's a few videos out there, but it's obscure and it's just not as good. All right, let's move on and see what our next game is after the latest handheld that you could play in 1981. Yeah, they're not. Maybe, I don't think they're numbered like that. It's uh, it, it's. I think they they were based on previous handhelds that had um uh. That, that had the Intex made their own baseball and then baseball two kind of similar to Mattel. Mattel had uh, uh, football and then football two. They, they, they're doing this uh, kind of a similar format as that. All right. So the next place we're going is the arcade and this is battle of Atlantis. Looks like it's the horizontally scrolling craze. That's taken over 1981. Let's take a look at the artwork for battle of Atlantis. This advertising flyer is by Karateko. At 100,000 leagues under the sea, in the great ocean depths, moves the most terrifying steel shark ever imagined by man of the electronic age. Submarine of the year 3000. The Kiriteko Battle of Atlantis invites you aboard. And they have a really tiny picture of the three different arcade cabinets. But Battle of Atlantis, this is one that uh, a company not as familiar as the other ones we've seen. And there's the back of the advertisement flyer. They are actually giving you examples of how to play. Your mission is to finish the six tables at all costs by eliminating a maximum of opponents. So, so they refer to it as tables instead of as we would refer to them as levels because it's going to continue to scroll and it's going to show more or different things on the screen. So it, it, it's, it breaks down all the different tables. Table one, avoid and destroy the floating mines. Table two, there's sharks that appear. Table three, you go through, to a, through a cavern. Table four, it's now towers. And then accelerate towers, and then table six, it refers, it goes back to table one. And then we got our opponents that we will play in Battle of Atlantis. There's an example of the arcade cabinet. Terrible picture of it. But there's our arcade PCB. Oh, yeah. For controls, we have up, down, left, and right. We have fire and bomb. Oh, man, it looks just like Super Cobra. Or maybe a clone of Super Cobra. There's our arcade marquee for Battle of Atlantis. And example of the screenshot. So we don't have a manual for this one. We do have a bootleg version in two different sets. We're going to play the first set. Here we go. Coming up to the arcade, playing Battle of Atlantis, released at some point in 1981. Published by Comsoft. All right, so right off the bat, we want to check out the attract mode and see what it does. So presentation-wise, interesting. You can move the shot up and down. We didn't have that um, in uh, any side-scrolling shooters yet, but it has the same one button to launch bombs, one button to... A fire forwards, or it looks like diagonally. Interesting. And the high score table is blank. We just plugged this in. It's the brand new arcade cabinet. Maybe we're in the arcade and we're testing it out before it gets flooded by all the people that want to play. Can you hack your way through impenetrable defenses? Hack our way. Sweet. All right, let's put a coin in and push and start playing the Battle of Atlantis. So I got a shot forward. Oh, it's nice. So when you move up and down, it moves the shot. Uh, with you so I can actually aim that shot and then I got another button for my bomb so I'm gonna get in arcade mode which means readjusting my fingers uh, to tap and play I don't notice a fuel gauge like we've seen in the other ones I wonder why I wonder if there's not a fuel gauge you just have to survive and destroy everything yeah the whole shots moving is kind of cool so it's moves slightly up and down I'm getting a little hiccup but might be the emulation not necessarily the the game itself we're now playing games so old that it's just possible it's just difficult to get the exact way it was played at the time. And we saw another one from Spain that did the same thing. Oh my gosh, now we're getting... Those are the sharks. 
Whoa, they look like missiles to me. So now it feels really like we're playing a horizontally swirling shooter and not a submarine game. Oh, but gameplay-wise, it, it, it's feeling like I'm playing Super Cobra. Nice, and we even have some depth charges being dropped from the top. That's cool. Yeah, the fact that I can curve my shot uh, makes me feel like I really got a lot of firepower. And without the time limit, I don't feel like I need to uh, rush to get any fuel. Oh, yeah, we got sh ships at top now. I can't, can't take them out yet because I can't get past the cave. Yeah, I can't shoot past the cavern sides. We're not getting as difficult as Super Cobra. Or maybe I'm just getting lucky. Uh, oh, <laughs> see, shouldn't have said anything. Now I really want to know, does it continue my play where I left off? It looks like it saved it there, but after we put a coin in, is the game over going to reset the entire thing or not? We also didn't get a manual, and I'm so used to games having a story now, where even Atari gives us a story for Super Breakout that I want to know, what is the Battle of Atlantis? Why are we why are we flying through killing sharks in the water? What, what, what's the reason that we're doing it? We don't need a reason. It's 1981! If you're playing the arcade game, you just want to jump in and play. Last episode, or two episodes ago, we had our first arcade game that had a story. That, that you, you actually had a reason and story behind it. At least in the operator's manual, there's a story. But you can consider the same thing with Donkey Kong. There is a minimal story. Go rescue... I think she's referred to as Beautiful Girl. Alright, so we're now in... Can I get up there? No, I can't. So the all the all the guys at the top, I can't do anything with them. It won't let me shoot past it. I just have to dodge the depth charges. All right, now they're blending it in with sharks. Oh my gosh. All right, so I have a little bit of uh, wiggle room because I can move my shots up and down. Wow, nice. Oh, wow. Oh, it's still going, okay, nice. So score's still working, high score's going. I also know I'm not going to die because I lost fuel or didn't hit any fuel tanks. You're just trying to blow everything up and get the high score. Wow, yeah. But the challenge is there, lots of fun. So, oh interesting, let me, okay, so I put in multiple credits, that's why. Now the credits looks like it's now taking me, after the game over, oh it does not continue. Yeah, so I didn't take over the same... Oh, wait, what did they call it in the manual? It's not a level. The... The... State? No, they didn't even call it a stage. It's uh, starting me over at the very beginning. So now I... Yep, I'm... Stuck there. Table, thank you. So th I'm not at the same table I was. Which means even if you have all the money in the world, you just have to be good enough to play to the next round. The, the very first arcade game we ever saw that allowed you to just keep going was fantasy. And if you had enough money, you just could keep playing and playing until you saw the end. Well, the the, the first round, because then it repeats itself. And it just gets, just gets harder. So that's another knock against this. Uh, you can't just continue to play, but for us, we want to be able to keep playing and see more. I want to see the other tables. Alright, so Picture this, it's 1981, you're in the arcade, after every other game we played, let's say you go somewhere amazing, that they bought the majority of the games that are brand new in 1981, and you, you start playing Battle of Atlantis, does it really stack up to games like Defender, which was released in February, or does it relax, uh, stack up to games like Frogger, or does it stack up to Donkey Kong? So as the shooter, it uh, actually is pretty cool and new to have this horizontally scrolling shooter. So if... Uh, there's no way it's going to get near four, uh, or, uh, sorry, five stars because it's not up to the rank of those games, but it is still very good. And it still has a formula that works well and is fresh. This horizontally scrolling formula. We've only seen one other game in the arcade that's doing a horizontally scrolling underwater and it was still done very well. So if we consider all the other arcade games, this still is, it's up there. It's above average. It's, it's a very good game for the time. So we're going to go four stars for battle of Atlantis. It is, it's still doing something that we haven't seen 
like from the entire perspective of all the video games so far. So four stars if it's 1981 and we're in the arcade. All right, so with that, let's see what our next game is after Battle of Atlantis. What's happening next? All right, so next we're going to the Apple II, and this is the latest release by SSI. We're expecting something really strategic, most likely. Yeah, Battle of Shiloh, it's got to be. And if I look right behind my head, we have two Battle of Shiloh. So we got one for the Atari home computer and one for the Apple. So um, the one for the Apple, I know we have more paperwork for. So let's take a look at the box for the Apple II version of the Battle of Shiloh. There it is. By SSI. Strategic Simulations Incorporated. And back of the box, yeah, historical war game for both App Atari and Apple. Yeah, this is it. This is the Civil War. More than a century ago, Sunday, April 6th, 1862, near a tiny log church in Tennessee, the Confederate Army on the Mississippi, 50,000 men, 16 brigades strong, under General A.S. Johnson launched a great surprise offensive in an attempt to drive out invading Union force led by Major General U.S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant. Thus began the first and fiercest battles of the Civil War, and thus begins the remarkable simulation that bears its name, the Battle of Shiloh. All right, let's take a look at any other artwork we have. Anything else here? Oh, there it is, the five and a quarter floppy disk. Oh, interesting. A tactical design group. I wonder if they helped with some of the distribution for it. There's an example of the screenshot. So for this one, we have everything we need to play the game. We have the manual for the Battle of Shiloh. The rule book, I should put it. So here we go. This kind of gives you the, the depth of complexity that can be possible at the time. So here we go. This is everything you need to know to play the game. It gives you the introduction about the history behind it. If you were really big into board games, this would be the game for you because it's essentially allowing you to play against a computer and play without having to get all the pieces out and use a, a, a large space. It's all supposed to happen on the computer. So it gives the introduction, options to save the game, load the game, and then how to get started. There's also a card that comes with it with like some quick tips to play the game. At this point, this genre is still a very niche genre for video games. The, it, the, the fact that there is a company, SSI, doing this is amazing. So they explain the zones of control, movement. Um, we're going to be uh, able to control either Confederate or Union soldiers and move them around. And it explains how the, the, the move, uh, how to move your units, how to attack with your units, and then all the different phases during attack. It's a turn-based strategy game. And they explain the combat, the rating system for all the different enemies, and uh, when leaders are killed, retreats, advances. Yeah, so it's a, a lot of information to take in. This is one of the games that you would have to spend uh, a, a few hours getting used to before you could play it. Let alone, it's going to be, if you play against another human player, someone else would have to have the knowledge of the game as well, which would be so rare. I can't imagine if I was in middle school or high school at the time in 81, and I was into playing this game, to find someone else at school that had the same game or was aware to play. Maybe if I had a buddy that could play it, but it's, it's look at this. This is a lot of information. Or oh, they even have the historical commentary at the end. That's nice. They give you some strategy and tactics. And so that's the manual, and we'll refer back to it if we need to. But we also have the player's aid card that came with it. It's like a quick, yeah, quick start rules. So if you don't want to consult the whole manual, it shows you how to load the program. Yeah, we'll refer to this if we need to. They ask the questions on the computer, what you want to, how you want to play. And then they talk about the uh, playing the game, which uh, how you start off with the artillery phase, then the combat phase, the movement phase. How do you save the game? And they explain the terrain, what all the symbols mean on the hex grid. And this is not new to us. On the channel, we've seen this back in 79. So it's uh, the SSI has been putting out games of this complexity for a while. They did go very slow. So I want to see if in 81 they've uh, boosted it and it's a little bit faster now. And then we have a breakdown of all the units too. So lots of com complex tactical video game playing. All right, here we go. Let's pop in the disc. It's sometime in 1981 and this is Battle of Shiloh released by SSI. There we go. They usually have the screen wipe by SSI. Classic for them. Hit spacebar to continue. 
How far we'll play on this is up to debate because we usually don't go too deep in uh, some of these games. Do you have a color monitor? Yes, we shelled out the color monitor. Do you want to play on a hex grid? So interesting they ask us that. I'm going to say no because I don't want to have the lines draw. But, um, okay, do you wish to play the first day scenario, which is the very first day that it came out? And you can see it's going to start us at 8 a.m. Uh, April 6th, uh, 1862 at 3 p.m. And then it's going to end... Uh, at night, uh, the 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 next or uh, nighttime on the sixth, then end on the seventh at three p.m. So it has the Union victory is the score that's uh, less than one twenty. The first day scenario displayed score will include a seventy five point reduction if Pittsburgh Landing is not occupied by a Confederate Union unit. So I guess you can play it not as the way it was intended. All right, let's push. Oh, do we want to play the first day scenario? Yes. We'll play the first day. Do you want to see the computer play a demonstration game? And the last time we played an SSI game, I just had the computer do a demonstration so you could see, and we fast-forwarded to do it. This time we're going to say no, and then uh, the computer will play as Union. Yes, we will be on the Confederacy. Union. And we're going to make the Union uh, terrible. We'll make them uh, ra ranking one. And then the computer as Confederate, no. So I'm going to make the Confederate super powerful with nine. So now we have... Uh, unions being played as the computer, and we're playing as the Confederacy on level nine. And you can see it's drawing our map. We didn't want to do the hex grid. I think it's the same map every single time because it's the same location. And I can speed us up just a little bit because I want to see how long it takes. Because it did the map, and then there we go. After it did the map, I thought the units were going were to come in. Whoa. Let's go back. You push one wrong button and the game might break. Yep, there you go. So do you want to play a new game? Yes. We are not loading any games. So now it should load in units for us. Let's see. There they come in. Yes. I was going to do fast forward. But this is what you'd expect at the time. And just bear in mind, it's 1981. If we were playing this on, the, uh, on an actual system at the time, one of the high-end systems, it would be even slower than this. Confederate artillery phase. So what we do now is we decide what we want to do with uh, attacking, light cavalry, medium attack, or heavy attack. I'm going to start with three heavy attack, and it shows our terrain. So we lost two CP, which I believe is your can. It's the points point value. So we can go back to our player's aid card. CP. What is CP? There's the terrain map, there's the Confederate unit, there's the Union unit, and then uh, CP is... Game units are br brigade size... Oh, combat points, okay, so they're refer we would refer to it in a role-playing game as like hit points, so CP is combat points. So I lost two combat points for doing that. Maybe a bad move? I'm not sure. So lost two, and then artillery points, and the way the game is going to be played is you pick each individual unit and for your turn you make decisions for every single unit and after you finish your turn for every single unit then you can also move units you can also attack units so for a strategy game in 1981 this is the 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 best of the best that you could play and considering the other ones we played like waterloo and the other ones by ssi this one actually looks kind of similar but it's playing a little faster uh, looks like it was programmed better than the other ones okay so it's giving examples of what we want to do next uh, so next unit, artillery phase. Let's do a light attack this time. And then we lost one combat point that time. And then it shows how many artillery points I have left. So let's do... Uh, you can see the terrain is also based on what's going to calculate if we make a hit or not. So let's do a heavy attack this time. I only have one point left. Okay, so we have to do a light attack. And lost one. Oh, it looks like the unit we hit lost combat points, not us. And so now the uh, Union's doing theirs. And it shows you how many artillery points they have left. They're doing attacks. And so, yeah, it, they're now attacking us on the next phase. So riveting stuff in 1981. Oh, they killed a leader already? I thought we made the computer really dumb. They were supposed to be one. Or maybe they just want to make sure the Union always wins because, you know, that's that's how it was. All right, so that was 
Battle of Shiloh for the Apple II. Uh, had a lot of information th to play the game, and uh, it is one of the best strategic games you could play, uh, or tactical games at the time. Um, especially if you were into this kind of history, because what SSI does is they pick a game or, or they pick a time period and they have a lot of different st tactical strategy games based on d different time periods. You can pick the one you like. W what do you want to play? You want to play uh, France, Napoleon? Do you want to play as Mongolia? Do you want to play uh, as uh, something more uh, naval warfare? You can do that too. So uh, for the time, considering every other game we played, uh, this one I actually could spend a little bit longer playing than the other SSI games. So I'm going to go with four stars. It's not really up there as like the best of the best uh, video games that you could play for a home computer at the time, but it, it is definitely up there. So we'll go four stars for the Battle of Shiloh. And we're just going to do a quick taste of the Atari version to show you the difference in graphics and why the Apple II is king right now. The Battle of Shiloh. Exact same box, exact same artwork, I think. Yeah, same box. Okay, we do have an advertisement uh, from SSI. There you go. This game released about the same time as uh, Tigers in the Snow. The Battle of Shiloh. All right, let's pop it in and check it out on our Atari home computer, released at some point in 1981. Will it load? Will it boot? Reverse the color? Uh, no. First day scenario, yes. Loading Shiloh. All right, so right off the bat, we got something to come up. This one we might do just do the demonstration to have the computer play itself and then fast forward it. I don't know if they're gonna have anything different with presentation either. It's essentially, you know what you bought. If, if, you, if it was 1981 and you bought the, the Battle of Shiloh by SSI, you knew you were buying something that was gonna be like this. Something slower paced, something tactical, something that was gonna be more strategic. Uh, restore a save game? No. All right, so Union rating. Let's make, uh, let's switch it up and make the Union amazing and make make them nine. And then the Union as computer, no. So I'll be the Union this time and computer will play as Confederacy. Well, let's make the Confederates terrible. Confederate as computer, yes. Okay, so we won't have them play themselves, but look at the graphics difference. This is the map compared to the Apple II. First of all, there's no color. If you had a color monitor, I guess it depends on the Apple II. But for the Atari home computer, there is color. You can see there's color, but they're not uh, they're not programming or displaying all the color. It's also even harder to see. So this is now the uh, artillery phase, just like we did before. Look at the unit. Uh, the units aren't displayed as the the, the same thing. We also we, we didn't have the manual for the Atari uh, Atari version, but um, all the paperwork we had in the Apple II, they explained this is what the Union soldier looks like, this is what the Confederate soldier looks like. But here, it's just um, symbols. That's it. Yeah, there's not uh, there's not people that there's not characters that look like people. They look like what is that an asterisk? And you're controlling the asterisk. And then for terrain, it's even harder to make out here. It's smaller than the the Apple II. So kind of a cool comparison between the two. Uh, I'm going to do what I did last time. Let's do a heavy attack. And they lost four combat points. Nice. So I'm doing my phase, but look at the 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 the, the characters are X's. It's almost like we're playing in the 70s the uh, Atari football game on the uh, in the arcades. X's and O's. All right, let's do again th heavy attack. We got enough points. Got it. And then one light attack. And then the computer's doing its combat phase. It's April 6th, 1862 at eight in the morning and we're playing as X's. Union Brigade, Defender's Level of Risk. Are they gonna do this or are we gonna do this? Let's do, uh, we're bold. And then defense strategy, nice. You can pick different defense strategies and we could have done this on Apple too. But just take a look at the presentation and see the difference between Atari and Apple. Kind of cool, kind of interesting to see both side by side and why the Apple II is amazing right now. At least for this game. All right, so for this version of the game, not four stars. I'm going to go with, uh, let's bump this down to, because of the presentation looking different, let's go three stars. Just about average for everything else we'd see for the time. All right, so with that, let's see what our next release is. Oh, it is the second one. So we did see Battle of the Bulge, Tigers in the Snow on the Apple II earlier in 81, and this is the Atari uh, home computer version of it. So it is a strategy evening. Let's take a look at the box for Battle of the Bulge Tigers in the Snow. I think it's the same one we saw on the Apple II. Any other artwork we have for this one? 
yeah, there we go. Back of the box, Atari and Apple, same one we saw before. So um, if you want to get a, a World War II uh, strategic game, this is the one for you. Yes. Example of the uh, floppy disk we play on. Yes, for the Atari 400 or 800 computer. And if you flip it over, you play on the Apple. All right, you got two different versions. Oh, no, it's, it's programmed in basic. This may be even slower than the other one. All right, let's pop it in and see. It's re this is some point in 1981, and we're playing Battle of the Bulge Tigers in the Snow, released by SSI. There we go. Loading. Now I'm scared. How long is the load going to be? <laughs> hey, good shout out from the chat. I don't know for sure. It, it maybe maybe he is maybe uh, younger, possibly. All right, do we want to play an old game? No, brand new game. Computers to play as German. No, we are going to play as German. German rating. Let's make them uh, nine since we're playing as the Germans. Computer to play as allied. Yes. And let's make the allied terrible. Let's check it out. So we, well, all we did on the Apple II when we played this was just do a demonstration and the, the game played itself. So without the manual, it is trickier. We'd have to follow the commands and, and sometimes you have to know ex exactly what command to type. We played other SSI releases, the, some of the first ones, where without a manual, you couldn't do anything because they didn't have these prompts or user interface displaying to tell you what to do. They didn't say push one, two, or three. They, they, you have to know exactly what command. The manuals were very extensive. Nine? One? Nine? Yeah? Yeah. Uh-oh, did it freeze? We're playing on basic, so it may take a while to load. Now I'm scared. Oh, it didn't freeze. It just took that long to load. Okay. So here we go. We are taking a look at the map. We actually have people that look like people now. So allied is up. Do you wish to attack this unit? Yes. We do. See, they're giving us prompts, asking us questions. Uh, will this unit attack? Yes. Oh, no. And it did crash. <laughs> I just wanted to attack the unit. Well, there you go. Not every time it's going to win or not. Well, crashing aside, though, this is still uh, fairly average. Again, it's a slight graphic uh, uh, graphics lower than the Apple II. So we'll give it again about average for what you'd see for the time for strategy games. At least for the Apple version. Uh, sorry, the Atari version. The Apple version, we did rate it much higher than that. All right, so that was Battle of the Bulge Tigers in the Snow with a genuine Atari computer crash. It's that basic. We should be you've been using machine language. All right, so now with that, let's move on to our next game after that. Yes. Our next release is the latest Phillips, Phillips Video Pack, which is the European version of the Magnavox Odyssey 2. All right, so check this out. Also makes music. Real computer training. All right, let me reset it. Hi, Space Kids. Starpilot Phillips here. And Cosmo. With our Phillips Video Pack TV game from Tutor. Check Starpilot. The Phillips Video Pack isn't just the sappiest video games, it also makes music. Real computer training. And a real keyboard. Real controls. Cosmo, this Phillips Video Pack is so advanced, it's frightening. That's because it's got the mind of a computer and the thrills of a Starpilot. Cosmo, Phillips wants you to have the best. <laughs> yes love it so this is an ad for australia which was it, phyllis video pack was available in that region as well but um kind of give you a heads up of what the advertising was like for this we, we've seen lots of releases on the phyllis video pack already it was first released in europe so that's the, the the first releases we ever saw and then we saw the magnavox odyssey 2 next this is the exact same game we had checked out when Casey Club Kirby was on the show as War of Nerves. And this is the European or uh, Australia-New Zealand release, uh, which is Battlefield. So let's take a look at the box for the Video Pack 30. So you can see on the far left side all the different regions' names. Uh, in Europe, it was called Battlefield. And this is debatable whether it's a real-time strategy game or not. I'll let you be the judge because it's kind of, eh, maybe, maybe not. But let's see what other images we got. Here's our, our box. And there you go. Yeah, War of Nerves is the other name for it on the Magnavox Odyssey 2. There's the example of the cartridge. 
that you saw Captain Phillips plugging into the Phillips video pack. All we got to do is push one, only one game mode on this one. An example of the screenshot. So not much there, but we do have a manual. Oh, a homebrew manual. Yeah, the War of Nerves homebrew manual. So we had to read this to understand how the game worked because it is a little different. I would give it as it's creative. It's not doing what other games do. And when we last played this one, I believe it was 70, 79 when we first saw it uh, for the Odyssey 2. Or no, maybe it was 80. I think it was 80. All right, so let's pop it in and play Battlefield for the Phyllis Video Pack. Yes. And as usual, in Europe on the Phyllis Video Pack, you pull it up, push number one, and there we're in. So I'm on the top left right now playing as the blue commander, and I believe I need a second controller. Yeah, I'm going to plug in two. So the second player will play in, down the bottom right. There is the second player moving around as the, the yellow commander. And the way it works is all the robots in the middle are moving by themselves and attacking by themselves. If one of the robots gets to the commander like it did there, <laughs> then the blue team wins. But the robots act on their own. So right now I'm not controlling any of the robots. They move on their own. I can control whenever they shoot, I think, right? No, they shoot by themselves. So they're moving by themselves, the robots are. As soon as one of the robots comes in contact with another one or shoots another one, they're frozen. So as the commander, I'm going to move myself down here on this side. And when I touch another robot, then they become back in the field to attack. And now I'm obviously going to win if I, unless I move the commander away. Can he even run? Okay, I'm, I'm moving the second controller now to move the yellow commander. Got him again. So you got to really play with two people. I think, let's see... <laughs> he does a little dance for victory. Nice. So for the manual, I believe there was a one-player way to... Pl yeah, there you go. There's a one-player version. Either hand controller will to lead your robots to the enemy general, but be careful. They're programmed by the computer to come after you. I don't know how that works because we only saw one button to push, which is one on the keyboard to play. You can see I'm going to move around and I uh, position myself in the right place. So it is, in a sense, a strategy game, sort of. So that time you can see I lost because one of the yellow robots touched the blue commander, and now the yellow commander does a little dance. Victory! So it's a stretch to call it a real-time strategy, but you do have to do some kind of, like, I'm, I'm moving down to touch this unit, and it's not uh, it's not working turn-based, but it, it's really close to being a real-time strategy game. I wouldn't say it's quite there yet. Uh, but but it, it is pretty cool. A great game to play with two people because you have to have the strategy to know when to uh, get your robots in play and yeah, get out of the way of uh, without getting touched by the, the, the robots and lose that round. <laughs> Love it. So let me try this and see if I can play a two-player. Or zero, maybe? No. Okay, I was going to see if I could play a, a one-player game, but it looks like you have to do it this way. And you're kind of playing based on the uh, artificial intelligence of the robot. So if you look down here by the yellow commander, there's a yellow robot that I can put in play. He's frozen right now. But then to the left of him is a blue robot that's, keep, that's wandering around aimlessly. So as the blue co commander, I don't think I have any way to control. Yeah, I don't. I can't lead him. <laughs> but as, as soon as I get touched by a yellow robot, then I'm out. And then the other, uh, the other player gets a point. <laughs> So there you go, it's War of Nerves that we played on the Magnavox Odyssey 2. So at this point, it's um, not as new or fresh. It, it, well, the, the concept still is fresh, yes. But uh, we, we've already played this before, and this is now a year or two later that we've seen um, the game. So it's still about um, average for what you see for the time. Uh, I love the creativity of it. Playing with two people is a lot of fun. So before we were giving it above average, I'm going to still give it about average for everything else we've seen up to this point. And if you think of this as the North American release of uh, or Magnavox Odyssey 2, they had a quest for the rings and uh, on the exact, pretty much the exact same system or hardware. And that's way, way up there compared to this. So we're going to go uh, just average three stars for Battlefield. All right, and with that, let's see what our next game is. After that, it's another Battlefield. This is Battlefield for the Atari home computer. All right, let's take a look at Battlefield. So this one's interesting because this is from Softside Magazine. So you would have to program this in. And here it is. Yeah, so from the magazine, this is Battlefield that you would type in yourself. It's a hand-typed game. There's the example of the game. and It even explains what it is. It looks like it's a strategy game 
that you typed in yourself from Softside Magazine. Wow. Okay, so at some point in 1981, we got Battlefield. Let's take a look and see what happens. We are not typing this in on the show, so uh, don't fast forward yet. Uh, it's going to automatically be there. There you go, Battlefield by Joe Humphrey. Way to go, Joe. Oh, the Atari translations by John Voska. Uh, can't pronounce the last name, but way to go, John. We got two players, black and white, on an 8x10 uh, board. Square owned by black is shown with the number of forces in that square against a black background. And white owned square has a white background. Squares containing both sides' forces are shown with letters representing the relative force sizes. At the end of each turn, battles are fought in each of these squares to determine who owns them. The first player to own all the squares wins. Okay, so it's it's kind of like a, um, a more advanced version of Reversi or Othello. At the beginning of each round, new forces are added to each side, and each side's movement allowances increase. The black player's name is... Who's in the chat right now? Ivan. Ivan is the first player, and who else is in the chat? L. Curtis B. Is white. How well this will play, time will tell. Because I don't know... Um, looks like for presentation, is drawing all of the grid. And I wonder if it's going to draw it every single time. Because keep in mind, in anything you typed into a magazine, you got mixed results. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. So there you go. It's showing forces. And it looks like we got five in each one. Oh, it has help. That's nice. So if you do help, there you go. So it has all the description, number of forces to move, backspace, deletes, end your turn, print this command list. There we go. Where's our, where's our Atari printer? Then you can print it out. Uh, nowadays, you just take a picture with your phone. And then uh, move forces to the left, right, and down. So J, K, and M, and then surrender. Okay, so returning to the game. Oh my gosh, it's going to draw it all over again. <laughs> so the hand-typed uh, battlefield from Softside Magazine is, uh, if we go back to help and go back in, it's going to draw the whole thing all over again. Wow. All right, so starting first with forces, if we do K, what happens? So you move them there, and then M to move, right? Oh, M is to go down. J, K, M. Is it L then to move? See, I already forgot. He still taking a, a picture of it. If, if I if it, if it was then, I would have printed it on my Atari computer or uh, uh, wrote it down on a notepad. But you use your commands and you move your forces around. So it's a it's a very bare bones strategy game. And th think of it in, in the scope of it, but the other things we play. We just went from uh, SSI's releases, two of them for the Apple computer, and now we're on this. Kind of shows you the difference between what tactical games were like at the time. But this one was a hand-typed one, so it's uh, it, it's a great effort. Pretty cool that you could play this if you spent the time to type it in yourself. So for the time, it is below average. It's uh, not necessarily bad for a tactical game. I'm going to do... Um, would it be considered bad? Would it be considered bad? Uh, I'll say two. Yeah, I'll say it, it's considered bad. We'll say the best of the bad for Battlefield. Considering everything else we played up to this point, it has a slight charm to it. And I always love when you can type in a game yourself because when you get it to run, it always is a better experience because you feel like you've you've done this yourself rather than just popped in and played the game. Uh, unless you have to, you know, uh, wait for the loading, and then if it crashes, saving, you know, all the other stuff. So we'll do two stars for Battlefield, especially <laughs> oh, yeah, easier to cheat. Yeah, you can reprogram it, right? <laughs> all right. So after that, we're gonna put our uh, game play on pause. Our quest is far from over. We're gonna play so many more releases. We're now in the Bs of 1981, and we'll press forward playing more and more games. We're blazing through though, so fast. It's one release after another, after another. Who knows where we'll be next? Thanks so much for joining me on Twitch and on YouTube. We will see what happens next time. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central. So join us and let us know if we miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.